Hi, welcome to NGWA's podcast series, Industry Connected. My name is Terry Morse, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the National Groundwater Association. Today, we've had the opportunity to meet with two principal directors and CPAs from an accounting firm called Ray and Associates. They're going to share their perspectives on the Paycheck Protection Program and the Small Business Emergency Loan Program. They're going to share their insight, perspectives, and expertise on how to, one, apply for the loans, two, get approved for the loans, three, manage those loans, track them properly so at the end of the eight-week period, your loan will be and qualify for 100% forgiveness. So thank you, and I hope you enjoyed today's broadcast. You know, my background is pretty much a general CPA. Uh, I've worked with, I've worked in tax, I've worked in audit. I currently work and do consulting in the retirement plan, qualified retirement plan space. And so I wasn't buried in tax returns at the time this whole thing broke. And so I volunteered and kind of dove in and became one of the firm resources for this whole uh, PPP loan process. And as well as the SBA disaster loan process. Um, okay. Doug kind of did the same thing, Doug, but Doug's background is different. He, he spent quite a few years, I don't know how many years, Doug, in the banking industry. So he, he right. has a really unique perspective on uh, how banks have been involved in this, uh, this whole PPP loan application and ultimately the forgiveness process. So if you have, Anyway, he's, he's been a wealth of information for us and for our clients to just navigate this whole process. So, Doug, I don't know if you okay. want to share some of your background. But. Yeah, I've, I started my career as a CPA many years ago, uh, 30 years ago with, with Deloitte, and then got into, as Paul said, corporate banking uh, for 20 years and did that and still have a lot of connections in that area and, and now been back in public accounting for two years. So, um Timing wise, it's been good because I've been able to rely on a lot of those contacts I have with the banks to understand what they're facing, what they need from clients, what they will accept, what they won't, will they deal with non-clients, uh, best practices, problems they're having. They've been so bombarded with just trying to get these applications in, they really haven't had time to consider the after effects, i.e., what do, what do clients need to be doing to you know document and track forgiveness? What are some best practices? Um, in fact, I was on the on a conference call with Fifth Third Bank this morning, and they had a problem because they didn't set up all of their clients with a separate account, and most of their clients are typically set up on what's called credit sweep. In other words, the the deposit balance is automatically sweep against the line of credit. So all the PPP okay. funds hit and they swept against their, their credit lines, which technically is prohibited under the, the PPP act. Now, obviously fifth third was aware of this. So they're, you know, working with their clients to track it, but there's just so many nuances and Paul knows this as well. You know, one of the other questions we just got this morning, um, was on transportation costs. That's, you know, you're getting down in the weeds here, but for example, that's defined within the act as being quote unquote, a utility. Well, nobody's ever given any clarification or guidance on what transportation costs mean. So, you know, how do we track that? What yeah. does it even mean? Will it be forgiven? Who the hell knows? You know, so, so there's just a lot start, of, a lot of questions. So starting on the front end then, um, what can businesses do to, to prepare on the front end to make that process easier with some of these financial institutions? Because it sounds like it's a, everyone, is, it's a learning as we go along. Yep. So what, sure. what should they do? Yeah, when they, they approach their financial institution, are there some documents that they pretty much almost, it's, it's a universal, they should have ready to go to submit that application instead of you know minimizing that back and forth going here and there? And then also, yeah, I, you know, tracking yeah, it downward. I can start that that answer. There's, there's, the, the loan itself is based on, uh, it's, it's focused on the a calculation of your average monthly payroll costs. 
And okay. so um, there, the most applications that are going to, at a minimum, need uh, for for you as a business owner to calculate, and probably using 2019. That's what the SBA application specified, although it's a little unclear in the actual act itself. But you're supposed to take some 12, some previous 12 month period prior to the crisis to calculate what your average payroll cost was. Um, and then uh, there's some different factors that go into that, but you complete that sheet, that calculation, and then you've got to provide supporting documentation for that. So that's going to be things like 941s. Uh, we were asked to provide, we do a lot of plan, uh, retirement plan administration. So a lot of our clients were asking us, can you give me a summary of, of all of our of, you know, the company contributions of all the employee contributions for 2019. So we had to come up with that. Um, okay. Copies of uh, employer contributions on behalf of uh, or to, uh, to healthcare providers. Is that all of that went into the overall calculation of what are, what is your average payroll cost? So uh, beyond that, uh, what they, what individual banks need for underwriting, Doug is probably better can better answer that. I think some are asking for copies of tax returns, things like that. I don't know that they all are, but do you know, Doug, or do you have any better insight into that? Yeah, I mean, generally, if they're an existing client, it's it's been pretty smooth in terms of the information that they want. It primarily revolves around some of the, the detailed payroll records. Um, but ultimately, they were able to, the banks were able to negotiate in the final act they don't technically have to verify anything. Uh, initially, when it came out, you know, the banks were charged with verifying this information and they pushed back on that because they didn't want to be responsible for it. So ultimately, it's incumbent upon the, the customer, the client, to provide uh, accurate information and they have to certify that it is accurate. And, and then the bank just, to be honest, they're doing kind of a cursory review of that and um, if it's a known client, much easier. If it's not, you know, a little more onerous, but they're not really digging into it a whole lot. Now, we don't know how much that might change with the forgiveness uh, piece. You know, there's an inspector general that was appointed by the federal government. How much scrutiny uh, starts to come into play? You've already seen that with some of the large public companies that got PPP funds. So, mm -hmm. We don't know at this point how much um, additional scrutiny there might be with the forgiveness piece, but as of now, the banks themselves aren't tasked with verifying that. Um, so it should be pretty pretty easy and smooth, but but really. So what, what, do you anticipate a, a checks and balance at on the back end of this to verify? Oh, when it very, comes time yeah. for forgiveness, how how's this all going to yeah. screw up? So the forgiveness process, and that is, I mean, that's where we're spending all of our time right now because our clients, these funds are beginning to hit, as Doug was describing before, they're starting to hit their accounts or they've created a separate account or, or it's been deposited into an existing account. Now they want to make sure they get, they qualify for the forgiveness portion, right? And so right. Um, now they're asking all kinds of questions about how do I calculate my payroll costs for purposes of the, there's an eight week period uh, following receipt of the loan that's it's really imperative that you spend all the loan proceeds and that you spend the loan proceeds on the right things in the right proportion and that you document that all the way through. But we're flying blind like we have with the rest of this process because we'd have, we have no application uh, right. to go by. It's yet to be thrown out there. So we don't know what the calculus, we have a general idea of what the calculation okay. is gonna look like. They're trying to encourage uh, employers to maintain headcount and maintain wages and salaries at pre-crisis levels, at least for the eight weeks, so that you can use up these loan proceeds and the loan proceeds get used for the intended purpose. Okay. Uh, but we really don't, we, in terms of the actual calculation and the ordering of, of how the reductions are gonna uh, be taken, if there are reductions, in the forgiveness amount, um, that there's a lot of mystery still, a lot of questions to be answered yet. And I don't, I, I haven't checked the Q and A's or the FAQs from 
SB8 yet this morning, Doug. I don't know if you did or not, but when I checked last night, there wasn't anything new out there. So yeah, nothing. It's been a, we've gotten a lot of guidance, but there's a lot of guidance yet to, that, that we expect to get okay. before, uh, before, before the application process starts. And, and you have to understand the eight week period is just now starting. The funds have just hit. So we've got this, right. we've got some time where we can, you know, pull this information together and, uh, and, and I think just having the application itself is going to answer a lot of questions, don't you think, Doug? I mean, once we get that, then I, I think agree. we can really begin to hone in on the important stuff. I would agree. We, we would hope, certainly. Um, we expect there will be some additional guidance, uh, either uh, interim rulings or FAQs, as Paul suggested, to clarify some of these definitions. Certainly, when we do get a, a an application, uh, once they develop that, the forgiveness application, hopefully that will have some clarity as well. But, you know, some of the primary issues we're dealing with, for example, if you start to think about it, um, is the forgiveness piece measured on an accrual basis or a cash basis? Well, yeah, it, basic it, question. <laughs> it doesn't 100% specify other than it says payments made. So, really the interpretation Payments made for in, for incurred costs yeah to me, that's, as, a, as a cpa that's it's like incurred is, is one thing <laughs> paid is another and you throw them yeah. together and what do we got <laughs> the the interpretation out there pretty much industry-wide right now is that that means a cash basis however they could change that they could come out early next week and say no no, no that's not what we meant yep. um you know because you get a lot of questions about you think about a business that maybe had to defer some rent uh, for a couple of months mm -hmm. that might have been for February and March. Well, now they're able to perhaps pay that, for example. Um, but does that count? Well, on a cash basis, of course it would. Um, ob obviously subject to the, the limitations that rent, utilities, and mortgage interest can't be more than 25% of what you spend uh, in order to qualify for forgiveness. But still, you know, there's, there's a lot of questions uh, with, with issues like that. The other, the other thing we get is like, well, okay, should I track this towards the end and then uh, maybe pay a bonus to my employees or give them some kind of hazard pay bonus so that I can, you know, juice up the, the payroll amount to make sure that I yeah. qualify for the maximum amount of forgiveness. Those all sound like good ideas and, and our best guidance right now says that okay, that's, that's probably okay. But the bottom line is we don't 100% know for sure. That's interesting. So how, how would a business then, I guess, try and plan accordingly and protect themselves based on just the situation you gave with accrual versus cash? How, how do they, how do they know what's the best way to go right now? They have to make a payment or work out a new contract or something. Uh, so with some of the stuff, some of the stuff is more cut and dry. And uh, what we're encouraging clients to do is to create a spreadsheet. Uh, we've got a spreadsheet that we created that, that we're using internally and, and the clients have, have requested a copy. We're sharing that. Now there's big disclaimers <laughs> at the top yep. of the spreadsheet that says this is, this is subject to change. But uh, what I'm telling clients, uh, cast a wide net. Let's try to capture everything that we think might apply. And then uh, another gray area that, that we're wrestling with is uh, for large profit sharing or uh, retirement plan payments that typically happen at the end of the year. Are those going to be, can, can we prepay those uh, during this eight week measurement period so that we can kind of juice up our payroll related costs and, uh, get to that to that 100% forgiveness level. Um, okay. uh, th that's a gray area. We don't know. It could be that when, when it's all said and done, you're going to be limited to just normal payroll related retirement costs like match or some sort of 3% safe harbor non-elective contribution that you would be making typically concurrently with payroll, uh, even though it's an employer contribution. Uh, we're not sure about these extra large uh, profit share and discretionary profit sharing contributions or cash balance contributions that our clients make uh, 
many of our clients may want. So <clears throat> let's capture that. Let's not do it right now. Let's see how the how the guidance plays out. And with okay. a little bit of luck, they'll be pretty, they'll interpret this thing pretty broadly in terms of what's includable and what's not. And then we can make a deposit towards the near the end, near the end of the eight week period and, uh, and include it. But uh, Doug, okay. is that, is that kind of how you're approaching it with your conversations? Yeah, absolutely. You know, be, be cautious and, until we get closer to the end. And then if uh, based on hopefully <clears throat> additional clarity and guidance, we can do some of those things, you know, pay some bonuses, do some additional right. things like that to capture maximum forgiveness. Absolutely. Okay. So proceed cautiously right now, hoping that there's going to be more details as we get further into this eight week period before we get to the yeah. end. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. We, we, we know we're going to get some guidance. We just don't yeah. know when. Uh, and okay. that's, that's the tough thing is <clears throat> clients are asking very specific questions and all we can really do is give them our best guess in terms of the way things will play out and then be right. honest with them to say, not sure. Uh, that's an open okay. question. It's not addressed directly in the act. Yeah. So we, we, let's say we get to the end, end of the eight weeks. Um, you've used all the money according to the guidelines. You're good to go, 100% forgiveness. But what if there's portions that um, aren't forgivable? How are those monies, what, what are the terms of paying that money back? So that's, Go ahead, Doug. it's pretty well defined in the act. Uh, it becomes a two year term loan at 1% interest. So obviously still quite favorable. Uh, those payments can also be deferred uh, for six months up front. So um, it, it's really still quite a favorable program, even if you don't get it all forgiven. I mean, it's a, you think about okay. it, it's a cheap source of capital, uh, very attractive. Uh, obviously, the extent you can get it forgiven, um, that's that's certainly more attractive. There's st we're still awaiting some guidance too around how to treat uh, ultimately uh, the the forgiveness. I mean, if you think about it from a gap perspective, you got to book this loan uh, as you would any traditional loan. Uh, we're also telling folks uh, account for the expenses just as you would under gap, mm -hmm. but at the end of that period. Typically, when a, a loan is forgiven, that's a taxable income uh, event. However, there's been specific guidance here that that's not the case. So then the question became, well, if you book that as income, then you have a permanent book tax difference. And what does that do? Um, the, the guidance right now also suggests, though, that those expenses will not be deductible for tax purposes, which makes sense if you think about it. They don't want to give you the double benefit of not taxing that income that you receive for the forgiven yep. loan amount. And then likewise, uh, giving you deductibility on those expenses. So they've said that uh, we think at least now that those expenses won't be deductible, which would wash it out from the books. But still, just like that, we don't have a definitive answer yet uh, on those right. things. So just a okay. lot, lot up in the air. Good. So kind of switching gears, but staying in the same world the sba loan uh the, the you need additional monies for operation how does that play into this the business owner how do, how do you know which is best to either go for this paycheck protection program or take out more of the sba loan that you know has a longer term payback but not forgivable where, where does that kind of play in and can you do both you have to do one or the other yeah i can i can start that response and then doug can jump in but we, we were having that conversation a lot early on. Uh, early on, it was just the disaster loan that was available uh, because the CARES Act had not been passed. And so we, that's what we were focused on uh, was what are the terms on that disaster loan? Uh, those mm -hmm. loans are up to just 2 million is the maximum loan on that. But the, and there's no forgiveness available on those loans. Uh, however, part of the CARES Act included an up to $10,000 grant that's part of the uh, what's known as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, the EIDL uh, loan through SBA. And uh, so, and they basically said, if you apply with very little information, you'll get it within three days. So of course, everybody applied. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
but there was confusion about what you could use those proceeds for compared to the PPP program. And so we were answering those questions a lot, I think. And even the banks were confused. Uh, a lot of misinformation out there. But it was clear to us uh, from the very beginning that as long as you didn't try to use, if, if you applied for both and were fortunate enough to receive loans from both programs, and we have clients that did, that did receive loans from both programs, as long as you didn't use the disaster loan proceeds to pay for your payroll costs, mortgage interest, rents, and uh, utilities, then then we think you're fine. Uh, okay. So as long as you can, and, and you can pretty much use the disaster loan proceeds for any, any normal operating expense, including payroll costs, I would say outside of the eight week period following the, the receipt of your PPP loan. Okay. So, uh, so you can really set those, these aside if you want to, if you don't need them right away, and use them after you've used up your PPP loan proceeds. In fact, I would say that's probably part of the best practice. If so, you can do so is that program, is that program still available and can businesses still apply? And would you recommend that they apply as a backup because you don't have to use the funds? Yeah. Yes. We 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 were very uh, adamant with clients that they should apply for both if they needed the cash. Okay. Uh, the e EIDL loan is very much focused on not payroll, but focused on economic damage. So you had to be able to show that your revenues had crashed, right? And that you had this sustained economic damage. But assuming you apply, you, you, you were eligible and you met the requirements for both loans, we encouraged uh, clients to apply for both. Um, you know, in terms of the, the, the terms on the disaster loans too, those are payable up to over 30 years. So it's a lot longer payback uh, compared to the PPP loans. And, mm -hmm. um, but the rate was a little bit higher. It's 3.75 uh, for any small businesses. So, but still a very favorable rate. Um, one, yeah. Doug, do you have any, anything to add? To yeah, that? one of the problems they did have with the EIDL though is because it, there were so many applications. They actually rationed the uh, uh, EIDL um, loan amount to a maximum of fifteen thousand dollars per company, which doesn't amount to a whole lot. Now, I should I should say that the act that's pending in Congress today, hopefully passed today or tomorrow and signed into law provides an additional 10 billion for the grant portion of that program and an additional 50 billion for the loan portion of that program. So hopefully that okay. should open that one up a little bit more so that it becomes um, more available and they can avoid rationing it as they had to with uh, sort of round 1.0. Uh, one other thing I wanted to add too, in my conversations with some of the, some senior bank execs, last night and this morning, they are already entering the applications for this round 2.0 so that as soon as, quote unquote, the, the, the law is signed and the system is turned on, th those will be already done. They expect this next round of $310 billion to be run through uh, in a matter of 48 to 72 hours max. So it really... Will it will go quite quickly uh, because the banks are all set up to process it now, which the first go around, they, they weren't really uh, as, as, uh, as ready to do it. So that's at least the guidance that I've gotten from some of the both major banks and, and smaller community banks uh, as of this sure. morning. So they feel they've already got enough applications in the system already just waiting to absorb those, those monies. Yep. Yeah, the interesting wow. thing, interesting thing uh, I'll just throw out there right now, and, and Doug and I were got, kind of going back and forth on it this morning via email. Uh, they, in this round of funding, they've carved out $60 billion for smaller lending institutions with the hope that these smaller lending institutions have relationships with smaller businesses. Yeah. Uh, there was a lot of concern, well, we alluded to it early on in the conversation, a lot of concern that big business was swooping in and applying for because of some of the exceptions that were made in terms of who's eligible 
uh, but but relatively large, even public companies were getting this these PPP loan proceeds. Yeah. And so Congress was very concerned that the true small business, the mom and pop out there, was not did not have a legitimate shot. They they weren't organized. I mean, if you think about it, the the bigger the business, the more sophisticated the advice. Yeah. The more sophisticated the people, the better the banking relationships. They, the, the, the skids were greased for, for those loan applications and uh, the normal mom and pop small business, you know, backbone of America type of business really had no chance in terms of, it, since it was first come first serve to get in there right. ahead of those right. requests. So it'll be, it'll remain to be seen. And Doug and I, Doug's a little, Doug's more skeptical than I am, I think, in terms of uh, <laughs> how that will actually work out. But I would, t- yeah. I would tell, any of your uh, members, if they missed out on the first round and they have a relationship with a smaller bank, they should be on the phone with their with their bank, okay. uh, seeing if if some of these funds were targeted for their size of institution. So they yeah. might have a better chance of kind of getting in ahead of some other folks. For Great. Sure. So I was just going to ask you. So if your your small business owner didn't have the resources to act immediately, like those larger companies. Um, maybe avoid some of the big banks who they've already got their applications filled out, ready to go to reach out to more of a community bank who maybe has a, a that has that um, uh, resource of about 60 billion that they're going to start taking new applications. So they can get in with that. And Definitely. Not get squeezed out. Yeah. Yeah. The, the carve out was 30 billion set aside for, banks that are under 10 billion in assets, which is still okay. pretty large. Uh, and then an additional 30 billion set aside for banks that are between 10 billion and 50 billion in assets. That's kind of a super right. community bank. So uh, under 10 billion, certainly more community, but yeah, it, I would absolutely advocate for all of your members to go to a, a smaller type of institution. I think they'll have much better uh, chance for success at getting getting an application in and getting approved and getting through the program in that in that way. Great. Yeah, Great. and I guess I I'll, I'll just let me let me uh, toss one more one last comment on in terms of um, the EIDL. We we know that there was additional funding thrown into that because it had it had been com- uh, you know completely tapped out as well. Um, but but. As far as we know, they've still got the same limitations in terms of the grants. Uh, you know, the CARES Act said up to ten thousand in terms of a uh, a grant that, uh, that that doesn't have to be repaid, not a loan. Uh, but they didn't really define how they were going to calculate that. Uh, SBA, after the fact, kind of decided, well, we'll do it based on employees. So a thousand dollars per employee, up to ten employees, um, you'd get. If you had 10 employees, you get 10,000. If you had more than 10 employees, you would still be maxed out at the 10,000. So we think that rule is still in, in play. I haven't heard anything to the contrary about that. And um, I'm assuming the $15,000 max loan is still at play. Doug, I, I don't know if you've heard anything to the contrary on that. Ha- um, haven't heard, yeah. W- one thing that's different, and we haven't really talked about, Terry, is the EIDL loans were direct online applications with SBA. There, there is no uh, bank or lending institution okay. that you go through on those. It's, it's, it's online. So we don't, we don't really have the resources that, you know, Doug has lots of banking contacts and resources that we can uh, get information from on the PPP loan process. We don't have those same resources on the EIDL loan process. So it's, it's the information is a little bit slower coming out. But Great. Um, as far as I know, those same the same same limitations are still out there. Okay. As, as we look to wrap this up, is there anything else you think that our members or small business owners should know that we haven't covered? I think um, you know one. Uh, like we said, I really would reiterate tracking all of this as best you can. Um, uh, through either a separate account, uh, also separate GL accounts on on uh, on your accounting system, if you can. Um, okay. Not necessary, but I think for ease of of tracking and all that makes sense. Um, just be be aware, try to plan, and as we get more guidance and get towards the end of this program, 
hopefully you can be ready to apply some of these funds towards things that we, we get definite uh, clarity around. Yes, you can use it for some of these things and take advantage of that to, to its maximum extent. Um, there is all, also a, one other thing I'll throw out there. There's a quote unquote main street lending program, which also is available for any entity that has $250,000 of EBITDA or greater. Um, now that program is just getting underway, uh, with the banks. It is also, uh, like the PPP program run through the banks. So there is um, a, an additional program that's coming. That one is not forgivable, but the loan terms, again, are fairly attractive. There are some uh, interesting restrictions with that program. So we're just starting to learn more about that as well. Um, so I guess I say all that to say more news to come, you know, stay abreast of, of the latest developments and communications. Uh, make sure you're talking to your banker and your CPA and, and getting good advice. Great. Yeah, and Terry, the, the only thing I would say, the only thing I would add that we really haven't talked about is very common question that we're getting with respect to the forgiveness piece of the PPP loan is, hey, I've laid off all or a substantial portion of my employees. Do I need to bring them back uh, and get them on payroll so they can use up this money? And the answer is definitely yes. Uh, one of the things, so, so the first bogey that you should have, the first goal that you should have with this money is spend it all, spend it all on the right things and in the right proportion, 75% on payroll costs if possible. Um, there are some reductions. We talked about those earlier uh, for headcount. If you don't maintain your headcount or if you don't maintain wages within at least 25% of pre-crisis levels, a couple different measurement uh, periods to compare there. But the first goal ought to be you know, if you, if you don't spend all the money, whatever you don't spend in that eight weeks is not going to be forgiven. It just isn't, uh, regardless yeah. of the reductions. At least that's our best guess at this point. So let's try to spend all the money and try to spend it on payroll costs, if at all possible, at least 75%. And, and there, will be, uh, there will be many companies that are very payroll heavy. And if somebody gives you two and a half months of payroll and so tells you to spend it in eight weeks, it's just, it's gonna be really hard to do it uh, if you can't do some of these bonuses and other things that we talked about. So uh, focus, the sooner you start focusing on collecting the, the expenses and trying to use up all of the proceeds in that eight week period, uh, the better off you're gonna be. I mean, you're gonna give yourself the best possible chance to get 100% of it forgiven. So that, that's, that's kind of how we're working with clients right now. Great. Okay. And, and as we move forward, uh, I'm assuming you all have your own uh, individual podcasts or information that you put out on your website that we could forward to our members. Oh, sure. If this goes on, if there's follow-up. We do. Um, www.raycpa.com. That's R-E-A-C-P-A.com. And we have a, a, an entire COVID-19 resource center. You can find copies of our webcasts that Paul and I have done. Uh, other information, documents, things like that, tools to help uh, with with planning and, and all of those things. Great. And we'll make that available on our website as well. So, well, yeah. hey, I appreciate your time today. I know you both of you are busy and you share some great information and some uh, insight that I think is going to be very helpful for our members. So thank Thanks, you. Terry. Anytime. Appreciate the opportunity. Great. great. Okay. Stay safe. Stay healthy. You as well. We'll talk to you Thanks, soon. Thanks, Terry. You thank too. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.